you very much for joining us on Mirror Now. I'm Hina Gampi. Today, we dedicate this program to someone who is a dreamer, a believer, a doer, an achiever, a mother, no wonder called a homemaker. Someone who's been battling barriers that a sizable half can never imagine. Someone who's been breaking glass ceilings which shouldn't be there, which no other species has, that she is you. It's International Women's Day, just one of the 365 days you make things move on earth. I want you to meet four wonderful women. They've battled every ism, hammered at barriers and shattered them, defied limitations, redefined what is possible. They've taken unconventional paths in a conventionally adverse ecosystem to taste success. Way before Beti Bachao, Beti Parhao was launched, these were the tailor-made ambassadors for it. Let me bring the arch lights today on Dr. Kiran Mazumdar Shaw, Executive Chairperson, Biocon Limited. They are Mirza, actor, producer, UN Environment Goodwill Ambassador and United Nations Secretary General's Advocate for Sustainable Development Goals, Global Ambassador, International Fund for Animal Welfare. Priya Agarwal Heber, Director, Vedanta Limited is live with us and Avni Singh, Spice Health CEO. Welcome to Mirror Now and a happy Women's Day to all of you. Dr. Kiran Shaw, I want to begin the discussion with you. You're a successful entrepreneur. Without going to a business school, you started your own company in 1978. At that time, when there were two global superpowers, you showed Indians that being a woman itself is a superpower. But you still call yourself an accidental entrepreneur. How did that path-breaking accident really happen? Well, you know, um, I returned from Australia as, a, as India's first qualified brewmaster. I couldn't get a job because of a gender bias. And it was an accidental encounter that sort of saw me start this company. So from being a job seeker, I became a job creator. And no regrets. And I often say that, you know, I started my company because of a gender bias. And th at that point in time, um, you know, I, I didn't uh, look at it that way. But today I feel women can do anything. And I think uh, I always tell other women that if I could do it, any of you can. Interesting. From a job seeker, you became a job creator. And that is why you are a role model to millions across the country. Uh, they are, you won the title of Miss Asia Pacific at the age of 18, entered a film industry skewed more in favor of men, made a mark not just as an actor, but as a producer too. They are today has become a name synonymous with sustainability, environmental and wildlife conservation. Has the journey been more smooth or rough? <laughs> well, I think as all women experience, it's uh, it, it has it's always uh, filled with challenges. I I can count. I think the first time I became aware of um, my gender consciously was at the workplace because I realized that uh, the male counterparts were given more preferential treatment. Uh, timings were always more flexible for them. We as women were expected to be more professional, more punctual. Of course, uh, I take great pride in punctuality and professionalism, but it was a mandate that was unspoken and was expected of female actors. And um, I, I remember thinking to myself that just because I'm the I'm the woman uh, and and not the male actor on the film set, I am expected to be here on time, be the first one, and possibly be even the last one to leave. Um, and it was much later that I also again discovered that so many people perceive filmmaking as a man's job you know producers the there are very there were at the time when i chose to be a film producer there were very few female uh, film producers and i was 26 when i started my production company and i remember women colleagues from the film industry saying to me at the time it's a very difficult job it's very challenging there are too many egos to manage and handle uh, it's a lot of money to be able to manage. Are you sure you want to do it? 
And, and I think that the only way uh, every woman and, and myself included, we've been able to do what we have had, we would like to do is because we've believed we want to do it and we care enough to do it. And that's how we, I guess, change things for others. Because shortly after I became a film producer, many of uh, the women in the film industry, younger women in the film industry decided to become producers as well and are, are now doing fantastically uh, as producers as well. So it's a, it's, there are many stereotypes, many gender biases that we find along the way. They still exist. Uh, we haven't been able to challenge all of them, but I guess with every choice that we make that is defined or definitive of the path that we choose to create for ourselves as women, as individuals, because we believe in our capability, uh, we will break those biases. Absolutely. Breaking the biases, uh, shattering all, all barriers is what we are really seeing it happening. And that's why we are talking about gender equality this time. Uh, Priya, I was watching an interview of yours and you said that you actually wanted to become an international music artist, but was appointed the director of Kane India. Music to mining and industry, again, seen as man's world. Was it tough to make your own symphony there? So I think very interesting, um, very interesting. And, and, and firstly, I'm, I'm a newborn baby in comparison to the women in front of me right now in the workplace. So really, really honored to be here with, with everyone, um, you know, with all of you. Um, I, I, I mean, I'd, I'd just like to start by saying that I was a very nervous, very shy young girl. Um, we moved approximately, I moved approximately 14 schools um, because my father with work, you know, we moved five, six, seven different countries. And so I never really felt like I fit in anywhere, um, you know, from, from facing severe racism in, in, um, in, in um, a boarding school in, in Surrey um, to being this very anxious person, watching my whole family's life change in a span of 20 years. I mean, when I was born, my father had to sell the carpet in our home to pay for my delivery. And to where he's now, it's been a pretty crazy journey for me and my entire family. Um, I think this journey generally shaped my personality and my career path in many varied ways. Um, and with this experience, I've also kind of developed this need for constant change, um, which is, you know, which is what brings all of this diversity in, in what I do. Um, you know, I haven't moved away from music. I haven't moved away from my animal welfare. Um, I like, you know, I, I call one my spiritual connection. I call one my passion and I call one my responsibility. And, and, and doing all of three together is, is what really keeps me engaged and driven and motivated. So, you know, I feel like my life is colored with quite a bit of variety. Uh, my passion has always been animal welfare, um, you know, and, um, and my first venture or the first thing I ever did was um, to start Yoda, an animal welfare organization that I run in, uh, in Mumbai. Today, we approximately transform the lives of about um, 2000 animals each month. Um, and, um, and while this was going on in my life, um, suddenly I turned on the television one day and I saw in front of me that there was an announcement that Priya Agarwal has become a director in Vedanta. And I was completely shocked. I went to my dad and I said, what have you done? I don't know anything about the business. And he said, I have faith in you. Just dive into the deep end and, and just, just do it. Just go for it. Just go for the board meeting. I know you, I, I know you, and I know you can do uh, I, I know you can do even better than and what I've done. And I remember my first board meeting. Um, I went to, uh, um, I went, I was greeted by all these people, these head on shows, these corporates. And, and the secretary in the lift tells me that your chairman's daughter, you know, we all have such, um, such, I mean, we're, we're waiting to hear the exceptional ideas that you're going to bring to the table. And I was shaking. I knew nothing in my mind. I'm like, I'm going to bring no exceptional ideas today because I'm still very much learning. And, um, but over time, uh, you know, uh, over time, um, I, it, it's been a long journey and um, I've been able to, um, I've been able to now fast forward to now where I'm still learning, but I've taken under my wing. I'm leading the ESG vertical, the industrial relations, the brand building, the CSR, and, and I've initiated last year, the Anil Agarwal Foundation with my team, um, which has committed 5,000 crores in the next five years 
towards a, a challenging mission to ensure no child goes hungry in our country and to focus on one health where animal welfare, people, environment are taken care of equally. So I think it's been a long journey, very exciting and, um, and, and a long way to go as well. Well, absolutely, uh, and a uh, very interesting one too. Uh, we have Avni as well with us, who's just 25 years old and already the CEO of Spice Health, disrupting healthcare in India with innovative, scalable, and cost-effective solutions. Avni, as we have seen in politics, the perception is that those who come from business families, it's easier for them to get to the leadership position. Is that so? Um, firstly, Hina, thank you so much for having me here. Some of my idols are on this panel and I'm really honored that uh, I'm a part of this. Um, uh, I think that, um, yes, I won't say that it's, you know, I, I will say that it's a little bit easier uh, because I was lucky enough to be provided a platform uh, to be able to move as fast as I did uh, when COVID hit the country. Uh, when I started Spice Health about a year and a half ago, um, there was a big struggle to get testing done um, quickly and in a cost-effective manner. Um, and so I had launched these mobile laboratories to get testing done at 499 rupees as opposed to 2500 rupees at the time. Um, but I don't think that I would have been able to spread the company as quickly and grow it as quickly um, if I didn't have the platform that I did have in my father and SpiceJet. So I'm thankful to that. Um, but that said, uh, I do think that, you know, Spice Health is, of course, a company in its own right. And we built it from scratch uh, when I had launched it. And in a year and a half, we've done about 5 million tests, if not more. Uh, and now we've also ventured into far more than just COVID. Um, in COVID, we did a lot of vaccinations and testing and, um, you know, uh, helped in other ways as well. Uh, and now we're doing smart health centers and pathology and so on. And so I think that I, dra I draw from the SpiceJet and my uh, family businesses uh, mentality of kind of being able to provide affordable, affordable and accessible services to every Indian. And that's what I'm trying to do with Spice Health as well when it comes to diagnostics. So it's helped me, um, but it's also very much a company in its own right, um, which uh, I'm very proud of as well. Okay, uh, and that's what we want to celebrate your achievement. And Dr. Uh, Shaw, like, you know, uh, what you have achieved in your life is clearly an inspiration for many, as I said earlier too. At one time for women, it was really difficult to find role models. Today, you are a role model for many. Who was your hero? Actually, it was my father, my late father, who was my hero because he's the one that really basically gave me, you know, the opportunity to do what I wanted to. He was one of the most liberal thinking men that I still know because he was the one who basically gave me the courage um, and the empowerment to do what I wanted to do. And he basically uh, banished the gender kind of uh, bias in my own mind and said that, you know, uh, I don't think, uh, you know, I should hold myself back. I have two brothers. So he actually treated us all uh, on parity and said that we should actually, uh, you know, do whatever we wanted to do. And, and that's why he's the one who really gave me the courage. I think we need to be inspired by people who give us that confidence and courage. And I always uh, believe that people who inspire me are people who, uh, teach you to believe in yourself. Yeah. Wasn't there any Masi or Bua in the family who would come to you and say, Bas ho gaya. now focus on family and leave everything else aside? Well, you know, Hina, uh, it's very interesting. Um, very often people would ask me, even if I start, even after I started my company, uh, people would come up to me and say, it's great what you're doing, but don't you think it's time to settle down? And I would say, I'm very well settled, thank you. Uh, so, you know, I think all of us go through these kind of expectations and uh, very stereotypical kind of assumptions about what we should be doing in life. And I think the time has come for women to break free from these myths and taboos. And I think that's what's happening today. Everyone on this panel, you know, uh, starting with Dia, starting with uh, Priya and uh, Avni, I think all of us have broken myths, broken barriers. I know that one of the 
you know, challenges that I've often had to face were these sort of uh, perception myths that women are not ambitious, women are not risk takers, women don't think big. And I think all of us, are, at least I know I have busted those myths. Dia has busted those myths, and I'm sure both Priya and Avni are going to bust those myths. So I think we need to make sure that we well, don't yes. get sort of uh, uh, boxed in and made to think a certain way. We have to really be our own, find our own, and do our own. Hmm. Uh, Dia, did patriarchy in any way block or threaten to block your path? Did you have any role model uh, who inspired you? You told us earlier that you believed in yourself and that's why you are where you are today. You know, I think it comes from, uh, you know, your upbringing, really, that understanding of self and self-worth. Um, I, I, for me, my heroes are my parents because they helped me believe in myself. They helped me understand that no job was um, undoable. Everything that I chose to do or everything that I chose to become uh, was all dependent on what I made of my opportunities and with what level of preparedness I met opportunity. Um, and I think that you know, earlier in your question to uh, Dr. Shaw, it was very revealing that you asked whether a Masi or a Bua uh, ever asked her about, uh, you know, the choices she was making. And I think that as women, this is something that we really need to consider because a lot of the biases that continue to permeate and exist, exist because so many of the women are unwilling to change and understand that any job is possible any job, a woman can do any job and do it well, that there is no reason for a woman not to be able to do it. Okay, interesting. Uh, Priya, was there any Masi or a Bua telling you to just focus on the family or you think you had uh, other things to look at? And as a woman leader, do you feel a lot of pressure to be perfect in every role that you have? So for the first half of the question all the time, um, we are grown up with Masis and Buas and, you know, countless number of individuals telling me that, you know, uh, you know, what do you, you know, don't work so much, you know, it's not good for you, women shouldn't be in, under so much stress, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But, you know, my mother always told me one thing. She said there's nothing more powerful than a happy woman. And that, for me, was um, was the ultimate, has been the ultimate you know, sentence or phrase that I've I've taken with me. She's she's always told me that success doesn't have to mean a great mother, a great child, a, a great daughter, a great sister, um, or whatever. You know, women today are expected to be these multitasking genius uh, geniuses who can do, who can coordinate work, home, X, Y, Z. Success doesn't need to mean any of that for a woman. And she always told me that if you're happy doesn't matter what you feel happy doing that is success and and i think that's what i follow and and um, and i think that's what i would like and that's exactly what i tell my daughter as well every day that whatever makes you happy just follow that and and that makes you the most successful possible person out there so that that for me was um, what, what was the second half of your question sorry missed that I was trying to understand, as a woman leader, uh, do you feel a lot of pressure to be perfect, to play all the roles that you play today? No, so that's exactly, so exactly that. I think with that strong support from my mother, I don't feel the need to be any sort of perfect. I feel the need to be happy. And wherever I feel is my happy place, that is where I belong. And the moment I feel uncomfortable in a situation, I know that's the situation. Either I need to fight it out or I need to get out of it. So into me from childhood okay avni okay avni do you think uh, things have started changing now for uh, the current generation who are getting into uh, businesses um i do think i think it really depends um for me personally i i mean i'm just 25 so it's just starting the whole conversation around you know you should think about settling down and all of that but I've been lucky to have a family which is very business-oriented. So I've always seen women working growing up. 
um, my grandmother runs her own uh, business, my mother runs her own business. And so I've seen very powerful women around me. And I think that maybe somewhere because of that, uh, I've never really considered that women are any less than men. Um, and that's perhaps because of the generation that I belong to. Um, and so I never really saw that divide until I actually entered the workplace and realized I started working with a lot of governments. I started working in a large corporate company. Uh, and that's when I realized that, you know, a woman has to speak up a little bit more and hold her ground a little bit more and maybe even talk a little bit more sense to be taken more seriously uh, because people kind of enter a conversation with a woman with, with a little bit of a bias. Uh, but at home, I was very lucky to see women role models all around me. And so I never really considered that as being something that was a setback uh, for me uh, professionally. Okay, they are now uh, talking about the theme for this year's uh, Women's Day. It's gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow. Uh, what does International Women's Day really mean to you? How relevant is it in this day and age? Well, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, Goal 5, which is gender equality, is a very, very critical goal. And when we talk about a sustainable tomorrow, um, we are addressing, and it's, it's in absolutely paramount that we address gender equality, because um, unfortunately, climate change impacts women more severely than it does men. Um, and uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, COVID has, you know, widened the gender gaps, made gender equality even worse than it was perhaps before. We've had major, major setbacks on girls' rights, uh, girls' education, and um, girls' safety. And I think that uh, every one of us, and, I, and it's so wonderful that the ladies on this panel understand this so well, but I hope that every person and every woman and every man watching this panel understands how critical it is for all of us to play our part and do our bit to help girls and women build back from this crisis that they're currently in the midst of. That has actually set us back decades. We had made some very important advances. We've been set back hugely. Uh, making education and opportunity and work accessible um, to women is paramount. It's so essential for societies to succeed and I really feel that it's it's so it, it has to become an inherent part of everybody's nature to do what they can within the sphere of influence that they have and the access that they can create to create a healthier, a more um, equal and a more sustainable world for all people. And I think uh, the theme this year uh, is is representative of the fact that we cannot hope to achieve a sustainable future without ensuring gender equality. Hmm. Very interesting because uh, after COVID came into our lives, Priya, it was uh, sustainability that became the buzzword. Everyone's really conscious about uh, the issue of sustainability. Uh, now, uh, what is your view? Uh, how important is something like a Women's Day for you? Why do you think it needs to be celebrated? So I would love to be sitting here and talking about gender neutrality um, over women empowerment, talking about inclusivity for all, he, she, her, them. Unfortunately, we're just so far behind that we still need to keep women empowerment as such a key and relevant theme. Um, our global gap report um, that we, you know, that recently came out last year shows that India will take approximately 200 years to achieve gender parity in the way that we're going currently. And I think that's, that's, I mean, that's not, that's not tolerable at all. And I think from what we see, 50% of our population is women. Imagine the power of our country if 50% of our population are given equal opportunities. And I think overall, the importance of equal opportunity is coming about. We see it Every day, we see it every day in our workplace. Um, you know, our first, uh, the first mining, um, the first mining manager in the country was um, a lady in our company. We had a lady uh, whose uh, name is Pavna 
Sanjana Devi, who was a part of our Nanghar program. Um, her family was earning nothing during the pandemic. Her husband lost her job, uh, lost his job, and uh, they were really suffering with about four children, um, two sets of parents, everyone to take care of, and no money. Um, she came to Nanghar, realized that she can learn skill development. She was because she had that opportunity close. That opportunity, and today in wedding season, she's earning twenty thousand rupees a month, which is more than her husband is earning. It's it's about getting that opportunity and giving women those opportunities. And I'm sure, um, with what we've seen from Indira Gandhi to Indira Nui, Nui, Indian women and the women sitting here today, Indian women can do it. Um, we have to, you know, take advantage of the powerhouse of women that we have. Um, our Indian culture is probably one of the most progressive cultures. We're taught to respect trans transgender individuals in our religious books. We're probably one of the most progressive cultures out there, but we've somewhere forgotten who we truly are. Um, this day needs to be celebrated each and every day, not just one day, until we can finally start calling ourselves proudly inclusive and equally opportun you know, and, and, and a place where there's equal opportunities for everybody. Okay. Avni, uh, how relevant is something like Women's Day for you? I think it's incredibly relevant. Like all the women on this panel said, uh, you know, um, Indian women are a powerhouse. And I think that while every day should be Women's Day and women should be celebrated every day, uh, it's very special to have one day that is, you know, dedicated to celebrating women because at the end of the day, we haven't reached, you know, equality or equity. At the end of the day, women don't have the same opportunities as men. At the end of the day, women have to work harder to be taken seriously and to be given the same opportunities. And at the end of the day, most Indian women do have boas and masis telling them that they need to settle down and that settling down comes at the cost of giving up your career. And I think it's very important on such a day to acknowledge that, look, um, Indian women can in fact do it all and can do it better uh, in most cases than even men can. And so why not give them the opportunity and see, uh, you know, what happens? Because I think that um, we can be, you know, a leading nation if we give and we already are but we can be really up there you know if all if we take advantage of 50 percent of our population and so a day like this is very special to just sit you know like take a step back and acknowledge and realize that um women can be much more powerful if they're just given an equal opportunity okay and uh Dia, now uh, coming back to you, uh, as we are today talking about gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow, and the latest data suggests that, uh, you know, things have started changing. In your opinion, when you see women around you, has the Samaj changed really or perceptibly or still a long way to go? We have a long way to go, Hina. Um, the change that may be occurring is hap occurring in a very small percentage, you know, and, and the impact is, is needs to become f wider and reach further. Um, Priya shared some statistics, which, uh, you know, is, is available and accessible for everybody online to see as well. Uh, we have a very long way to go. Uh, to achieve this. And I think when uh, we talk about achieving a sustainable future, we're also, I think it's so important for everybody to understand that human health and progress and, um, you know, peace and happiness is completely interlinked with the health of the planet. Uh, and, and that, you know, when the health of the planet is in jeopardy, it impacts all people and it impacts gender and it impacts, uh, you know, so many of the things that we've just pointed to in, in, in the past few comments. Um, there are horrifying statistics about how there was a rise in domestic violence, uh, how there has been a rise in uh, children and girls, especially dropping out of school because of COVID. And I think we don't spend enough time understanding the role of nature and the, the, the kind of havoc um, climate change is playing on women and women's lives. Uh, so there is a perceptional shift. There is a slight shift because there are female leaders in all walks of life who are now role models for other women to understand that when we are given the opportunity to educate ourselves, when we are given the opportunity to empower ourselves, we are capable of doing and achieving anything. And, you know, whether it is, you know, reaching um, 
space or it is leading companies or um, you know being successful entrepreneurs whatever it may be we're capable of doing it all but the number of people who are getting this opportunity is too too small and that number has to rise and i really feel heena that the future is female because wherever women are in leadership roles wherever women are taking the lead whether it is whether they're leading governments or they're leading companies they're doing much better than their male counterparts <laughs> fortunately or unfortunately but that is the truth and uh, there is also enough statistical st statistical evidence of the fact that wherever women are in roles of leadership the organizations are happier the 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 environments are more empathetic are more caring more kind more sincere and uh, and and are more successful and how do we do that uh, you're saying that you know perceptional shift is what is visible right now priya uh, what should now be done so that more and more women are there at the leadership position because you know there was another data that i was looking at which suggested that uh, many reach to the managerial level but there are very few women ceos or who become directors of various companies uh, so what should be done what is it that you are doing say for example in the mining sector so there are two things i'd like to say um one is a small example i'd like to give um, you know there were uh, there was a, a nice little riddle um, i was reading online um and i was asking um, a few people around me um a father and a son were in a car accident and when they reached the hospital the doctor came rushing in and said that's my son how is that possible and when i asked this question everyone was confused the only person who actually got the answer right was my 7 year old daughter um she told me because the doctor is the mother and uh, you know it just it just doesn't strike you um at first that a doctor can be a woman as well at you know even in in, in my in in my generation i would have thought that would have changed by now but it wasn't coming to me <clears throat> immediately but it came to my daughter and and so it's so evident that we're not born with this gender bias it's something that has kind of been drilled into us and i think first and more foremost i feel women need to take a break and need to break this bias within ourselves we need to go, go to our workplace as a leader and not a woman leader we should not be expected to be treated differently neither should we expect more respect nor should we expect less of course but we need to break out of this inner bias ourselves and just make sure that we see ourselves as leaders and not women or any different to the men in our in in, in the company that we're in so first and foremost i think it's something that we internally need to work on at large secondly i think there's a lot india inc can do to ensure we speed up this process of women in leadership um vedanta has taken up um a strong policy that in the next few years 30% of our leadership will be women and and if and, and and if you build these very very strong targets we'll make sure we achieve those and women do get those opportunities then and i think every company should you know kind of have ha write out or or maintain these targets such that more and more opportunities are given to women in leadership policies within the company maternity leave paternity leave all very important we've learned in the in the lockdown um you know that everyone can work from home so these all opportunities to ensure women even um even during motherhood can successfully work and take care of their child so these policies need to very very strongly be implemented in all our work in in, in our workplaces such that um you know women are given these opportunities and feel comfortable pursuing these opportunities as well and um, if you really and, and another example i'd like to give which is also very important there's um, a, a global company rio tinto a mining giant did um, a self analysis in the company and found out that 21 women came out um, and said that they were sexually harassed in the company they put this study out there themselves although they got a bashing for it they put it out there themselves and said that this is a problem that we have and we're going to fix it and i think that's very important for all of us to do we should internally analyze study how our women are feeling in our company um and if there are issues we need to put it out there and we need to make sure we fix it so i think it's 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 a very very big responsibility that all of us have if we've been given this opportunity to run such big entities 
we need to make sure that we um, encompass um, policies within our entities to, to ensure more women join and, and feel very comfortable within in the environment as well. Hmm. Avni, uh, you also have a huge responsibility when it comes to ensuring gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow, uh, given the position that you are in. What is it that you are really doing to make your company, for example, uh, women friendly uh, or, you know, around you? Uh, what is it that uh, should be done uh, so that we have more and more women at the leadership position? Um, I think I completely agree with everything that's been said uh, so far. You know, firstly, um, the confidence of being a woman and being a leader and not just a woman leader comes from within. And that's a message that needs to be spread uh, very, very strongly. Um, and and this is something I always say to, you know, uh, people within my company and even people I talk to outside. It's that you should walk into a room as a woman knowing that you're a leader and being confident and believing in what you have to say. And whether someone wants to hear it or not will be determined by how confident you are by what you have to say. So a lot of that confidence comes from within. Um, and that's the that's the first thing I think that I would like to say um, is that, you know, be sure that what you have to say is heard and be sure that you say it because you deserve to. Um, the other thing I'll say is that, you know, a majority of my leadership at my company, Spice Health, is actually women. And it's been women since uh, since the inception of the company. And I think that it's been incredible that way. Uh, because, you know, um, like we've been discussing, women are very, very, um, you know, good at what they do. They are very sincere. They are very um, delivery, de deliverable oriented. And they, are, they can be very, very ambitious uh, if they are just given that impetus and motivation to be that way. Uh, and often not even then. And so I think uh, that's one thing that I have done is very consciously made sure that a majority of my leadership has been uh, female. Uh, the other thing, um, you know, like we were discussing about women's safety is something that I'm very, um, you know, uh, personally involved in in the company to make sure that everyone from leadership to the molecular te technicians and everyone in the company at all levels, um, all women feel secure and safe within the company. Uh, because unfortunately, this is a very, um, you know, common issue where women can feel unsafe uh, at a COVID lab, uh, you know, you're working long hours, you're working throughout the night, uh, labs are functioning 24 seven. Um, and so um, initially, uh, this concept had come up that, you know, women don't feel comfortable at night. And so the night shift should be only men. Um, and some women actually did come up to me and say, look, I feel totally comfortable. So why does this have to be a thing in the industry? And so I didn't show that while women were there at the lab, we had cameras, we had them we had an anonymous email that they could, you know, use to talk about their experience. They could reach out directly to me if they felt uncomfortable at any time. And so I think that's something else that we can do to ensure that uh, women feel motivated, safe, and comfortable uh, to be in such positions. Um, and, you know, set some goals for having a certain number of females in an organization. I think that's very important as well. Okay, and uh, they are, before I ask you to uh, share your ideas on, you know, bringing the change in society that it's yearning for, uh, in cinema specifically, with more and more uh, women-centric uh, films being made, do you think that change has started happening? And, uh, you know, in a way, films show us what's happening in the society. So if via films we are celebrating women and their achievements, do you think in real life it has started changing? Changing? Of course, there are themes that are led by women, and thankfully, there are more and more themes and stories that are being led by women. Uh, I hate saying female centric because you never say male centric, right? Um, so, I think uh, what's wonderful is that because there is a bigger representation of women in the industry now, there are more writers who are women, more directors who are women, um, and, and t more technicians who are women. Uh, I think it's it's helping improve our narratives. Uh, also, because stories now are being, especially female themed stories, are being viewed from a female lens by women, and I think that makes a big difference because there were many stories, and that doesn't take away. It. I'm not taking anything away from the men who write these stories as well, because some of them write them really well. But I think it makes a big difference for women to tell a woman's story as well because the lens that a woman sees herself from is always more astute. 
Um, I have been fortunate enough to be a part of themes that really challenge patriarchy, question sexism. And I think that themes and these narratives can definitely improve the way society is understanding and responding to the way we, we, we behave and we treat each other. Thappad, I think, was a wonderful example uh, of a film uh, that made people question the idea of uh, raising your hand on a partner and um, and even though you know a lot of people said but it was one slap i think the question is answered by the film itself because that one slap makes makes the woman within the narrative question her identity her well-being her sense of self and her self-respect and i think that it, it's themes like these it's stories like these that need to be told for more people to understand how deeply ingrained patriarchy is, how deeply ingrained sexism is, and how much work it will take for us to break these biases, shatter these myths, and really break away from patriarchy. I really believe in the power of choice. And I think that when we as women make individual choices, I'll give you a small example. Um, at our wedding, we had the choose. We had the choice to, uh, you know, uh, obviously have a pandit, uh, but we chose a female priest um, because it was. It. I, I don't think I set out to shatter patriarchy or or break stereotypes, but I just felt so wonderful when I experienced a wedding that was led by a female priest. Just the way she read the mantras, the way she conducted the ceremony spoke to me so deeply. I felt so um, in sync with what was happening that I chose to have the same at our wedding. And um, I think it's every choice that we make that will determine a path for us as women. And I think in many ways will determine the path for many more women. Um, and, and that's true for the stories that we tell, the stories that we, are, that we represent, and also the story that we create of our own, the story that we create of our own lives. Uh, and, and I think every woman on this panel is doing that, including you, Hina. And, and that's how we will bring change in society. So when you decided to have a woman priest for your wedding, uh, did someone in the family question, did someone in your friend circle question your decision or it try to stop you that, no, this is not how it is supposed to be done? Nobody questioned it, but everybody was surprised. They were like, wow, you have a female priest. We've never seen that before. That's unheard of. Um, but I think what everyone experienced at the wedding was exactly the experience that I hope that everybody would have to be completely connected with the ceremony because she had the power to do so and she did it so beautifully and I think everyone was just amazed at how beautifully she conducted it and then of course when we shared uh, you know stories or visuals from our wedding so many more people came forward and said we never knew that female priests even existed. And it's just so nice to see so many more couples now consciously choosing a female priest because they do exist. They aren't as many as men, but they exist and they're beautiful. Beautiful story, in fact, uh, indeed, that you've shared with all of us and our viewers as well. I think uh, it's all about uh, uh, you as an individual. If you decide to do something, then nothing can really stop you. And, uh, you know, it's your story, story like yours, Dr. Shaw, uh, Priya and Avni that we've heard that really inspired many. And that's why we had you on this very special show today. One last question for each one of you. Uh, what is it that you will like to tell uh, somebody who's watching you right now, uh, you know, for whom you are a role model? What will be that one message that you will like to give uh, to someone who's watching you? Let's begin with Priya. I'd like to say exactly what <clears throat> my mother's told me. Um, don't, don't stress too much to, to be what you feel or what the world feels is uh, is successful 
just the most powerful woman or the most powerful individual in the world is a happy woman. So wherever you feel comfortable, whatever you want to do, define your own path of success. Don't let anyone else define it for you. Very interesting. Avni, what is your message to people who see you as your as their role model? Um, I think I mentioned it before as well. Uh, my message is that, uh, you know, uh, believe in what you have to say and say it. Don't let anyone stop you. And don't shut yourself up or shut yourself down because you think that that's the more appropriate or right thing to do. What you have to contribute to a conversation matters. And you need to believe that. Um, and I think that that's something that I would not only say to, I mean, that of course is very, very relevant for women. That's something that was very relevant for me as someone who used to be shy and would not uh, speak my mind and, you know, hold back. Um, and I think that's how you can make impact because um, if you don't uh, get what you have to say or do out there, you're never going to be able to do anything about it. Okay. Uh, Dia, I want to give you the last word. Well, I work with all kinds of young girls all over the country, and I've seen girls who live under flyovers fly because they've had access to education. I think one of the most important things that every girl must have is access to education. Nothing is more empowering than that. Um, and then, of course, what defines our agency is our ability to ensure that we are financially independent. So work hard, create your own paths, and walk and speak your truths because you are beautiful and unique and wonderful in your own authentic way. All right. Uh, thank you very much, all of you. Thank you for joining us here on this special show. Thank you for sharing with us your stories. And clearly, uh, it is a day uh, to celebrate the achievements of you and all the women in the country. I wish all of you once again a very happy Women's Day. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us, Hina. Happy Women's Day to you.